Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Free-flowing talk with a charismatic, down-to-earth host. Join Dean as he interviews and chats freely with his guests, ranging from superstar athletes to politicians, industry titans, and everyday folk with fascinating life stories. Dean educates, entertains, and most of all, touches people's lives. You're listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dean Blackman Show. Beautiful winter uh Winter uh, afternoon here on the Eastern Long Island, here in Setauka at the studios. And uh, here in the studio is uh, my good friend, senior correspondent, Scott Morell. Scott, how are you today? I feel great today, actually, Dean. I feel such mazel coming up for the holidays, the Hanukkah, and uh, the new year. I'm very excited. Going across the globe, over the Atlantic Ocean, the lovely Rhea Bo. Rhea, how are you this morning? Hi, everybody from the UK. Thank you for joining us. Just a couple of words before we go in. Our wonderful, fabulous, issue-free Scott Morell is his birthday today. Oh, my goodness. So happy birthday, Scott. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Scott. Thank uh, you. Also here in the studio is my dear friend, Rabbi Mendy Goldberg from Lubavitch Chabad in Quorum, Long Island, New York. Uh, Rabbi Mendy Goldberg, Thank you for being with us here on the Dean Blackman Show. Thank you, and wishing everybody a happy Hanukkah. It's a very happy time, a joyful time, and uh, getting ready to light up the world. Wow, wow. What, what a, what a, wonderful what thing a great, to say. I am so pumped up and excited today. I'm that, inspired uh, by that. This time of uh, the year for us to have uh, Scott here on the studio uh, on his birthday. Uh, this is a holiday show. We've got Rhea over across the globe. And on short notice, uh, just this great human being, friend of mine, uh, now my rabbi and uh, my shrink. Uh, Rabbi Mende Goldberg. Uh, we don't want to disclose uh, all information. <laughs> <laughs> this is being broadcast. Uh, remember that. This is very special show. I was very excited today. And Scott, uh, from all of us uh, here at the Dean Blackman Show, I want to wish you a very happy birthday and uh, great health uh, in the future. I really appreciate it. I am 25, but this is when dyslexia comes in very, very well. So if you see it a different way, you might know my age. <laughs> Rhea, why don't you take it from here, the show? Okay, darlings, no problem. Um, right, today, uh, today is, we're recording this on winter solstice, so it's quite a big day for me. It's a nature thing, so as the rabbi said, it's a love and peace thing. We're going into the outward time, so we've got to spread the love, people, you know, that's the way to go forward. Today is a different show. It's just about two topics, one posed by myself and one posed by the rabbi Mendy there, who I haven't met yet, by the way. So... But there's no news tacked on the end, so it's just two subjects. One posed by myself, which is, is the human spirit in trouble? And one posed by Rabbi Mendy, which is, how are the holidays relevant today in 2016 and 2017? And as we have the lovely rabbi in with us, I think it's the courteous, respectful thing to do to let the rabbi take the lead on where his thoughts are on the holidays. But until then, back to you, Dean. Thank you for that introduction, Rhea. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to send it over to Rabbi Mendy Goldberg now to uh, get us started on this uh, subject today. Okay, so thank you for giving me the lead here. Uh, it helps me say what I need to. Not everybody's saying, well, you know, taking my words away from me, right? Not only, <laughs> not only that, but you've got a huge uh, European audience there uh -huh. in, in Europe through, uh, through Rhea. And nice meeting you, Rhea. I know we haven't met in person, but you're always welcome to fly across the Atlantic. We'll make time to meet. And, um, and everybody out there in Europe, the holidays for all of us, wherever we may be, are pertinent and applicable. But why I pose the question, how are they relevant, is because many times, especially from the Jewish holidays, pick any Jewish holiday, explain it to a child, what do they say, or not even to an adult. A Jewish holiday boils down to one phrase. There was a war, we won, let's party. <laughs> <laughs> Take it if it's, if it's Passover, if it's Hanukkah, if it's, uh, pick any holiday you want. That's what it boils down to. I'm not sure about Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur too, it's just the war with between ourselves, the that's, evil inclination and the godly inclination. That's very good. You know, it's the, the guy that once came to the psychologist and he wanted a uh, group rate for his split, split personality. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Mendy, we're off to a great start. <laughs> 
and uh, it's always been the outset <laughs> of uh, the show to uh, inspire, educate, and always have some humor. Okay. And uh, it's not too too often that I find a rabbi with a great sense of humor. Well, I you, found that in you when I met you. Well, a you got to know ago. that. Interesting, you say that because going back two thousand years ago, two thousand years ago when the Talmud was written. The Talmud states that there was a great rabbi by the name of Rabbah. And this fellow rabbi had a massive yeshiva in the city called Pompadisa, today modern-day Iraq, where he, the way he started off his lectures was he would say a joke, and only then would he begin with the lecture. And why did he start off with a joke first was that was to wake people up. It's not like today, sometimes the rabbi, uh, once there was this rabbi giving a sermon and this guy snoring really loud, so he calls over the... One of the people and the president, he says, go wake up the guy. He's snoring really loud. The president tells the rabbi, well, you put him to sleep. You wake him up. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask Reba. Uh, Reba. I said Reba. <laughs> Reba. <laughs> I'm to, thinking of Reba. She's I'm going, thinking about the great rabbi. She's from, going, Come on, Reba. You have a back to biblical times. She's only <laughs> English. English. I oh. wanted to. I, I wanted to send it back over to Ria so far <laughs> with uh, what Rabbi Mendy's saying. Anything you want to say, Ria? <laughs> Feel free. So Sorry, go on. No, I said, feel free to interject. This is free-flowing. Yeah, the, the way the system works, I can't interject very well because I'm coming over Skype, so it will just cut me out if anybody speaks. But it sounds great. Anything that wakes people up, I'm all for, Rabbi. Okay. What, how it works is I've got to tell I've got to tell everybody, as the host, I've got to tell everybody, shut up and keep quiet so I could send it back over to Rhea. So that might happen from time to time. No worries. Okay. Right. It, it, it's a 90% banter. 10% we have to just say, Rhea, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so back to Hanukkah. What? makes the holidays relevant and it's very important because as jewish people today living in america we sometimes can't even identify or even in europe wherever it may be identify with what the jewish people went through at that time and just because they went through it two thousand years ago doesn't mean that we have to celebrate it today what's its relevance and in fact if we look a little bit deeper into the message that hanukkah is telling us and just to summarize it the hanukkah message is probably most pertinent in today's day and age when looking around the world the world today, just look at the past two days, the tragedies that occurred from Berlin to Turkey, whether you agree or disagree with the politics that's going on in the world, everybody will agree that unfortunately evil is making its mark. Darkness is being a little more predominant than it was in previous times. And what the Hanukkah message tells us, if you notice, when we light the Hanukkah candles, it needs to be dark at night. You can't light the Hanukkah candle while it's light. It needs to be dark. Is because a little bit of light dispels much darkness. And when we as people, every single day in our life, increase, not just stay stagnant, but every single day, light one more candle in our life, bringing more happiness, bringing more good, bringing more love, being whatever light represents, which is warmth, automatically that will dispel and get rid of all the darkness. Mm -hmm. The Jewish people in the time of the Greeks, they were a small army. There was over 40,000 Greek troops, while there were less than 10,000 Jewish troops to the greatest accounts of that we know of in historical uh, um, reviews. And still in all, they were, they were able to overcome the mighty Greeks who were then the superpower of the world. The small little minority of Jewish people were able to do that. Wow. The same idea is also today. We may think, well, look, there are thousands of evil people out there. They're destroying. They're destructive. How are we ever going to stop them? And the problem is that most of us think globally instead of thinking locally. It goes like the guy that wanted to change, he was on his way out to a world peace conference, and while he backed that out of his driveway, he smashed the car behind him, and they stopped him. He said, where are you going? He says, I'm, I have no time for this. I'm going to a world peace conference. <laughs> you got to first start with your own self, with your own home. And interesting, you know, everything is by divine providence. Scott said it's his birthday today, and he's uh, dyslexic of which uh, age he may be. You know what? Judaism teaches us that a birthday is a time to celebrate. Why is it a time to celebrate? Because it's another day in your life. It's another year that God tells you, you matter. You're here for a reason. Wow. You lived another year because you got a purpose to do in this world. And every single day that we get older, every single day we are lighting another candle in this world, making this world better. And guess what? I can't do your job. You can't do my job. We can't do anybody else. We're all unique, special in our own way. That's why we all have our own birthday and our birthday is a Rosh Hashanah, is our new year. Wow. Mm. It's our time for reflection, introspection, and saying, 
how am I going to continue lighting the candle? Wow! Let we every time uh, uh, I'm with every time I'm with this gentleman, uh, I'm just reinvigorated with uh, just energy, just tremendous energy. Ria, what do you think of so far what Rabbi Mendy has to say? I love the positivity. Uh, it reminds me of what Gandhi said, and that was um, "Act local, think global." So. Uh, in a nutshell, I relate to it in that way, Rabbi, if that makes any sense to you. Scott, uh, anything that you want to say so far before Rabbi Mendy continues? Yeah, I, 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 that, that's a wonderful perspective, how to look at it. And uh, he might get me to go back to Shoma Shabbos after this episode. <laughs> 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 Rhea, I just want to let you know that we almost started this show another half hour late. Ra uh, Rabbi Mendy brought uh, a bunch of supplies, and uh, when I met him the first time a couple of months ago, he put on tefillin for me, and I haven't done that since I was a 13-year-old kid when I was getting bar mitzvahed. Uh, Scott knows what tefillin is, but it would have taken another another half hour. Why don't you tell Rhea what, and, and, and those in the audience that don't know what tefillin is. So, uh, Ria, let me and first of all tell you, a half hour, that's only Jewish time. It really only takes about two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do it after the show but, here in uh, the studio. We're going to put on tefillin, Scott and I. So what tefillin is, in fact, they, you know, what's the reason why we take a moment every single morning as Jewish people? We take three times out of our three times during the day to pray. But we start off the day with putting on tefillin. Tefillin is, uh, if you recall, I'm sure, Ria, you've seen a mezuzah which is a scroll on the, every door, every Jewish doorway has a scroll, which, uh, you know, when they, at the doorway of their home, which protects the home and the people in the home while they're in the home, while they're out of the home. That same similar scroll that has selections from the Bible are placed into these leather boxes that we put on our arm by our muscle and we put on our head by our brains. Uh, and the reason for that is because we take our emotional and intellectual faculties and dedicate them to God. And every single morning before we start our day, one of the biggest challenges for us as people is to uh, be a little less self-centered. As human beings, we are created as materialistic beings, physical entities, and by nature we have selfish desires that we put our body before our soul. And because of that, we become antagonistic, we become apathetic, we don't necessarily have the compassion and feeling to grow, to motivate, and instead we started looking at the people around us and creates animosity, jealousy, and things like that. So what we do every morning is we charge ourselves and we take our emotional, intellectual faculties and we say, you know what? Our soul is more important than our body. And if we can just have a little bit of that uh, integration of our soul being higher than our body to get us motivated throughout the day. And if even just a moment of the day, we can be a little selfless instead of selfish, then we've done a lot. Wow. Rhea, what do you think of that? Yeah, I'm just listening content contently. I feel like I'm at a Jewish sermon or something like that. <laughs> I try um, not to sermonize. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, I, I'm dealing with what you're listening to. I mean, I'm not Jewish and I know very little about it, but I'm just soaking up the positivity, really, Rabbi. It's one beautiful thing that, um, you know, some many people ask me, uh, are rabbis only for Jews? Is Judaism only for Jews? One of the beautiful things about Judaism, and I'm everybody's willing to interject here, is that Judaism has something for everybody. Judaism has a universal message. Judaism doesn't say if you're not Jewish, you're doom and gloom like other religions may say. Judaism has a universal message of positivity. Judaism is not about, all about what you're not allowed to do. It's, in fact, all about what you can do. And because you're so involved in doing so many things, you just don't do other things. Um, so regardless if we're Jewish or not, the message of Hanukkah is pertinent and relevant. Religious freedoms is pertinent and relevant. Adding in light is pertinent and relevant. And I think um, this is, you know, especially you, Ria, being not Jewish, helps us uh, understand and appreciate us what Jewish people have as well in our traditions. Wow. Yeah, uh, what I love about Judaism is the celebration of life. Uh, that is the most sacred part of Judaism. You know, a lot of other religions um, focus on the afterlife only, and they bypass. And I, I'm a full believer of living the moments, being mindful of the moment. So I think that's what I take from Judaism. Wow, wow. It's, what a great, great message, especially this time of the year that we're having a show like this. Yeah, it's beautiful about Judaism as well, need to know. Um, and Rhea, I'm sure you can help us uh, expound on that is in other uh, faiths and religions, there's more about what's going to happen to you 
after 120, if you're going to burn in hell, you're not going to burn. How are you going to burn and where are you going to burn? Judaism doesn't even focus much on that. It's only, in fact, we don't even talk about burning in hell. We talk about hell as a, not as a destination, but as a cleansing. That means all souls are ultimately good. We come into this world, they have a little bit of, uh, you know, challenges, let's call it. And then we want to ultimately return to the place of ultimate good. And in order to get back to good, you got to just clean off all the schmutz and all the dirt that you've collected all along. So uh, that's uh, that's our perspective. Ria, why don't you, if you have any uh, questions from your perspective, why don't you chime in? You ready for me to stir this up? Sure. Oh, that's what we love about that's you, Ria. What's great about this, Rabbi, and I told you this when you were coming over, that it's unbelievable. I don't know of any other show that we're able to, I don't, I don't know of any TV show or even a radio show that's able to combine uh, cultures of how different, you know, here we are in Setauket, uh, Long Island, in my home studio, and here we are crossing the Atlantic, and we get, we get an opportunity with someone special like this uh, every day, Rhea, to uh, to join, uh, integrate cultures that are so different here in, in our worlds. I mean, the way this is going, if, if this becomes ongoing, we could sort of name it, you know, the rabbi and the shiksa. <laughs> I don't think Rhea, she knows what the shiksa is. Rhea, do you know what shiksa is? I've got a guess, but go and tell go, me. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, it's, go just, ahead. it's just, um, <laughs> it's sort of a, it could be a flattering word for a very attractive uh, non-Jewish uh, lady. I would, I would, okay, yeah. I'll- yeah, I guess that. I mean, perhaps that's where the word chick come from. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think I think Rhea Bowe's got a great, a sh- sh- is it Shainai Punam? Shainai Punam. Shainai Punam. She's got a great Shainai Punam, uh, right? That's a, uh-huh. pre- that's a pretty face. That's a pretty face, Rhea. You got a beautiful face. Oh, you're very kind. You're but very why don't you, kind. But why don't you go ahead? Let's, stir th- let's have you uh, stir things up, Rhea. Okay, here we go. Gently, though, you know, and for the good as well. Is um, So I have a question for the rabbi. I listened to your statements and they are inspiring. And I think I am, I'm feeling the positivity which I would allow into my life any time. The question I have is, with all this positivity going on, why has the Jewish faith and Jewish people been persecuted so much? Great question. Great question, Rita. Great question. Anybody else want to no, take a no. shot at it? I, th- I think it, it, it may be, it's a test uh, from Hashem. Uh, okay. That we survived. That would be my my only. I mean, try. Scott, you want to take a shot at no. it first before that, no, uh, Rabbi would, Mendy does, or that, that was it? That was my shot. Okay, that, that's so an, Rabbi test. Mendy, why don't you? That's uh, a answer. great question. And you know what? I'll answer it in two ways. Uh, go back to the 1940s, 1930s, when Jewish people were probably having the hardest time in this uh, country. Who were the uh, comedians at the time? Jackie Name, Mason, uh, Henny Youngman. Name any comedian. They were all Jewish. Okay, Jackie Mason. Jewish people, through the guidance of the Sid Torah, Caesar. Uh, name any of them, but gen- generally Jewish people, through the guidance of the Torah and the, you know how Jewish thought, we are told to take any situation and make it into a positive one. Um, because the Jewish people's unbelievable positive attitude and always never relenting um, ability to continue in the resolve to keep Judaism alive... Regardless of the persecutions, we're still here today. Others aren't. Go back to Egypt. When the Jewish people were in Egypt, Egypt is not here today, as it was then as a superpower. Jewish people are here. Rome, Greek, Spain, Germany. Pick a country. Wherever Jewish people were, that country became the superpower. Eventually, that country persecuted the Jews. The Jews then left. That country fell apart. And the next country became a superpower. Why are Jewish people persecuted? That's God's decision Unfortunately, you know, like the fellow once said to God, God, if we're the chosen people, why don't you choose somebody else for once? Wow. Yeah. wow. But uh, the concept is God, why God chose to persecute the Jewish people, that's not our decision. That's not our question. He doesn't ask us. He doesn't take our advice. There was once, just to put it to you in a cute uh, way, there was once a bunch of great philosophers sitting around the table discussing if they were God, what would they do? And uh, suddenly a little kid walks in. A kindergarten child walks in and hears these philosophers discussing this. And he looks at them and says, if you were God, I would be, do- if I were God, I would be doing exactly what he's doing. Because if I were God, I would know why he's doing it. 
So why are Jewish people being persecuted? I got no idea. Should people be Jewish people being persecuted? They should never be being persecuted. We don't know, as in the words of Isaiah, my thoughts are not his thoughts, my ways are not his ways. And we ask of God every single day in our prayers, enough of the persecutions. We want to come to that time of a world of the utopia of peace and tranquility, which we call the era of Mashiach, the Messianic era. And we hope and pray for that any day. But the ability for us is, um, you know, we got to be able to stand up to the persecution and our resolve is when we say it in the Seder, when every generation there are people that want to get us, and thank God, God protects us and watches over us and gets us through it. Wow, that's powerful. Let's, uh, Scott's got a, a question he wants to ask. Uh, yes. Some comment. Uh, Robert Mendy uh, Goldberg, um, it was very interesting about a lot of people um, misinterpret what the chosen people are about. And I think people think that there's a, a level of arrogance that the Jews are the chosen people. But from what I've learned, and tell me if I'm mistaken, it's just the opposite. We chose to follow uh, Hashem's law. So it's like we made the choice, our group, the Israelites and so forth, our tribe decided to accept those laws. So we're cho- we- we weren't chosen, we're the chosen people of the people that choose. Is that correct? Um, it's correct, but it is also the opposite way as well. Meaning, we're not, the chosen people doesn't come from arrogance. In fact, I tell any person, they said, you want to be part of the chosen people? You're more than welcome. Accept 613 commandments, stop eating all your favorite dishes and whatever it may be, and uh, join along. Nobody, chosen people, if you want to say it from an arrogance terms, means we're exclusive. Jewish people are not exclusive. Anybody that's welcome to wants to Jew in Judaism is welcome. Right. It's not an exclusive club. Uh, why we call the chosen people, and that even other faiths, Christians, Catholics, Muslims, even call Jewish people the chosen people, because going back, dating to the time of the Jewish people when they were in Egypt, even before so, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God chose the Jewish people out of the Egyptians and said, you I am taking out of Egypt, and I am going to give you the Torah. Now, did he offer it to the other nations of the world? He did. They rejected it. And today they reject it flat outly. So as the chosen people, it's not a question of arrogance. I'm better than you. We just have a separate set of laws. We're a different, uh, we're a different uh, way of thinking. It's a, but every single person ha- can create a relationship with God. Every single person, regardless of their Jew and Gentile. In fact, the Jewish people's job as the chosen people is to be a light onto the nations, is to educate the people around us. And as we've seen throughout the world, and you can see it today, pick up a newspaper. If a Jewish person does something wrong, it's on the front page. If it, And they write, Jewish guy does A, B, and C. If a Gentile does it, it doesn't say, a Gentile fellow that belongs to this and this church, and you'll find it maybe in page seven, if you're lucky, or something in an odd page in the bottom column that he'd not that we're a question of anti it's just the question we're held to a higher standard. Mm-hmm. Why are we held to a higher standard? Because God made the world that way. Why did he choose us? And when you choose something, and this is the interesting thing, and that's why there's no term of arrogance here, true choice means that there's no overwhelming factor to one thing or another. That means if I ask you to choose between a thousand dollars and a million dollars, that's not a choice. You're going to pick a million dollars. Choice means that everything's equal. When God chose the Jewish people, it wasn't because we were better. In fact, the angel said, why are you picking the Jewish people? They're just like anybody else. These serve idolatry. These serve idolatry. But God chose the Jewish people. And any person that ever got an aliyah, which means somebody who's called to the Torah, the blessing you say is, Asher bochar bonu mi kalam v'nasan lanu es Torah. So that God chose us from all the nations. Not because we're better, because that was his decision. Now that we're chosen, we have a set of laws that we have to oblige by. We have the responsibilities we have to oblige by. And being chosen gives you two parts. There's a responsibility at the first front. And then second of all, there's a merit. Wow. So you, we first have to live up to our responsibility. Powerful, powerful. Once we live up to our responsibilities, then we, there's something that we can, so to speak, if you want to call arrogance about. But as I said... There's nothing arrogance about it because anybody that wants is welcome to join. No, I I, I agree. So what you're saying is that um, uh, God uh, uh, made an offer to a lot of different uh, groups at the time. Uh, we were the ones, 
that chose to accept it, which was, which was kind of what I was saying, yes. that there's a misinterpretation of arrogance. We chose to accept it and follow, you know, the 613 and, and, and you know, eating, uh, you know, uh, kosher food and so forth. So, Correct. Okay, thank you, Robert. I want to I want to go back over to Rear. Rear, are we staying on track with uh, with our subject and topics? Uh, and also, I want you to continue to light the fire. Yeah, I'm not going to light it too much. It's just about finding an understanding for someone like myself to gather an understanding, really. So, is what I'm hearing is God chose Jewish people as the chosen ones, and people outside of the Jewish faith saw that as arrogant so therefore you was persecuted is that correct um, I can't say why we were persecuted uh, you can take any given time and age anything Jewish people did it's an interesting th thing if you look historically why Jewish people persecuted there were many different people that tried to uh, give psychoanalyze why Jewish people were persecuted and the uh, bottom line is there's no one factor that causes people to be persecuted ever since the beginning of age uh just last week in the torah we read about jacob and esau two brothers esau was considered the gentile jacob the jew he wanted to kill his brother uh go a little bit further the jewish people are in egypt the egyptians want to kill the jews the jewish people come to the land of israel the canaanites the amalekites the Chirites, anybody person wants to kill the jews and it was nothing to do was before anti-semitism was made and before the concepts of uh of uh, jewish people being successful owning the banks and stock market and everything else so the whole venture of Jewish people being persecuted because of their success uh, is there's no reason. As we go back, as I mentioned before, our ways are not God's ways. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Why things happen, we don't know. What we pray and for, hope for, is a time of peace, tranquility, a messianic era, a time when there will be peace and tranquility for all. And when the persecutions will stop on all accounts. In fact, it's an interesting thing to talk about persecution of Jews. And I'm going to diverse a little bit and try to blend this a little more. The world today, the suffering that's going on in the world, just in the past two years, 500,000 people were killed in Syria. Terrible. Wow. wow. Nobody makes a, says a beat about it. It's a funny thing. I mean, it's unfortunately funny or hilarious when you talk about the United Nations Security Council in the past two years put out, I think, 10... Uh, to 10, I don't know what they call them, the things against Israel. Uh, UN resolutions. Res UN resolutions, yes, against Israel. While not one mention or even the oddest thing is the oddity of is it that Syria is on the UN uh, peace or something like Council. that. Peace Council. And they're the ones rebuking Israel for doing war crimes, which they're the most, according to all accounts, I think there was a British uh, newspaper that wrote and did some investigation and said any type of uh, uh, army, the ones that are the most considerate to the people of their enemies is the Israeli army. So we live in an era of confusion, of absolute disarray. Uh, and that's what it is throughout the world. So persecution on all sides is a terrible thing, hmm. and that's why we as the Jewish people on the forefront pray for peace and tranquility for all, all humankind. It's not just for ourselves that we pray for. We pray for every individual. Well, that's what uh, Rhea, when I first met uh, Rabbi Mendy Goldberg, uh, what was unbelievable is uh, it's the first time that I experienced that uh, in a religion that uh, everyone Everyone, uh, not just Jews, but all people are welcome into Rabbi's home, into his congregation. Uh, it's just a, a beautiful thing. It's not just Jews. Yeah, um, what I do love about Judaism is, is very um, welcoming. It's non-exclusionary. It's, it's um, a matter of fact, uh, when Rabbi Mendy, when you were talking about uh, the atrocities in Aleppo, Syria, um, it doesn't make the front pages because they do it because it's the way Jews uh, treat people in general. They've been uh, taking in thousands of Aleppo refugees that have been injured into um, hospitals in the uh, Golan Heights, Galilee area, and you don't even hear about it, right? Am I, I don't correct? Believe it, yes, the amount, Israel set up hospitals right outside in the Golan Heights and, uh, and treating Syrian people, uh, refugees that are coming across the border, uh, think about it also, anytime there's a tragedy that happens around the world, you name it, in Indonesia, Bosnia, who knows what, the first ones to send medics to help people is the Israeli team that sets up, and whether it was in Haiti, wherever it may be. And guess what? Are they still going to hate us? They're still going to hate right. us. And that's what we got to do. I'm going back to Ria, your question. 
what's the reason for persecution? There is no reason for persecution. Nobody can ever justify persecution, regardless on whatever race, people, or humankind they can be. So, okay, can I let's send, let's send it back over to Ria. Yeah. Go ahead, Ria. Question: Can you get women rabbis? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, it's a great question. It's a, I great think it's a, question. I think it's a denomination question, but I would like to hear from Rabbi Mendel. I'm going to answer that question in many different ways. What? Uh, actually, I'll answer the question like a Jew answers the question. What's a rabbi? Um, I have no idea. I'm just curious to how the hierarchy works. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's good. So that's she, a great she, doesn't know what a, she doesn't okay. know what a rabbi is, and she wants to know, can you have a woman ra- okay. rabbi? Okay, very so. good. Qu- so very good question. So I'm going to take you a little bit, I give you a little bit of historic and maybe a little controversial here, uh, because there's nothing more exciting than controversial. I'm going <laughs> to tell you from, from a perspective, from a Hasidic perspective, from a uh, perspective, from a Chabad perspective. You got to also help her with Hasidic. Okay, and Hasidic, Chabad, which, perspe- Chabad perspe- was what the uh, philosophy that... I believe in. And Hasidic. And Hasidic is the um, ha- more of a joyful, positive experience of Judaism. Isn't, it, what, isn't it also cultural? Cultural. It depends. Yeah, some come from, it depends Eastern what European. you call it. Eastern okay. European, but it's also Russian. So it's right. not necessarily Sat- regulated okay. to some, oh, today, different terms and names. And, le- and that's where I'm going to start with. Today, unfortunately, people became more comfortable with labeling themselves. And that's the biggest problem by not with starters. For starters, we don't like to label people. Every Jew is a Jew. Every person is a person. And we have to take the people for who they are. Labels are for cans of food and for, uh, you know, other stuff. Not for people. That being said, what is a hierarchy? Is there a hierarchy in Judaism as all, uh, at all? When we come to a hierarchy, there is no hierarchy in Judaism. Every single person whether they call themselves a rabbi or not, has a relationship with God and is able to cultivate a relationship with God. It's a one-to-one relationship. Judaism, different than every other religion, and I know many rabbis may be upset by what I'm saying is now, is that you don't need a synagogue to pray to God. That's wow, correct. Wow. You, you, don't, you need to, 10 men. Yeah. You need, no, you don't even need 10 men to pray to God. You don't need a synagogue to pray to God. You don't need a prayer book to pray to God. You need to have a soul to pray to God. Wow, wow. And in order to pray to God, and in fact, I'll tell you even a step further, the synagogue itself is the place where Judaism is least observed. And you look at me, and Scott's looking at me, uh, look, yes. I made a business of uh, having catering wow. goals, and they say, I'm not talking about the catering goal. <laughs> that's, where they, that's where they observe most you, of the Yeah, for the audience that doesn't know that not only is Scott here as a senior correspondent on the show and my friend, but we go back 18, 19, 20 years ago when he was the caterer for uh, my Three daughter temples. Allison's uh, uh, bat mitzvah, and, and a couple of years later, uh, Jared, my son's... Uh, Bar Mitzvah. Yeah. So I'll, I touched upon this in, our, in the first show that we did, but I'll just reiterate just some main points and because everybody looks a little shocked at me, especially by my... Uh, uh, so And getting back to the rabbi part. The synagogue is a place where we recharge our batteries. It's a place to reinvigorate. It's a place to for community, for people to get together. That's what the synagogue is. The relationship we have with God is a one-to-one relationship. A rabbi doesn't get involved. A rabbi can help you, can assist you, can direct you. But at the end of the day, it's your relationship with God, nobody else. And what is the synagogue there is only there to facilitate it. Even so, to take it even a step further, a synagogue in the old days was called Bet Knesset, a place of gathering. Such a type of place, you were not allowed to learn there. You were not allowed to sleep there. You were not allowed to eat there. It was only dedicated for praying for community, getting together to pray. Wow. Now... Within prayer itself, there are certain parts, to get back to what Scott said about having 10 men, there are certain parts of the prayer, for example, a Kaddish or reading of the Torah, that you need 10 men to be able to make a minion, to be able to have a quorum of people, to be able to say certain prayers. But if an individual wants to pray, if an individual wants to say at any time of the day, can open up a prayer book wherever he is and pray and make his place a, a, a holy place. Um, d- does that have to do with the Amida? Uh, isn't that a, a, a one-on-one, a silent prayer? And can that it, can you do that by yourself, or do you have to be in a synagogue? Any prayer you can do by yourself. Certain prayers, that means there are certain prayers, what happens is, and I, just, I don't want to get, I want to go I back wanna, to the rabbi thing. Yeah. So I'm just going to answer that question very quickly, is there are certain prayers that there is a qualification. For example, there are called a, sancti- a sanctification of God's name. And being that, going back in the time of the desert, the way 
10 men desecrated God's name. In order to correct that, we need 10 men to, uh, to sanctify God's name. But that's something different. So going back to the rabbi question. So now that we know what Judaism is and what the rabbi and what the synagogue is all about, facilitating people's ability to achieve a relationship with God, it doesn't make a difference now if you're a man or a woman, if you can help somebody facilitate the job of giving them or helping them have a relationship with God, that's your job, whether you're a man or a woman. Now, why the rabbi term? Where did the rabbi term come from? The rabbi term comes from, in fact, the word comes from the first rabbi was Moses. Moshe Rabbeinu. He's not called Moses the leader, Moses the king. He's called Moses our teacher. He taught the Jewish people Torah. Traditionally, the one who gives and teaches Torah to them in public is a man. So therefore, the common job of the rabbi's job, facilitating not only that, being that the quorum of men to be able to facilitate the sanctification of God's name had to be 10 men, so it had to be a man who would lead the services for the quorum of men. So that's why traditionally men are rabbis. However, in helping people be inspired about Judaism, probably women have a greater role. They may not be called rabbis because there's no hierarchy, as I mentioned. I tell people, yes, in my house, I'm the head of the house, but my wife's the neck. She tells me which way to turn. So there's no hierarchy in Judaism. Every single person has an ability to have a relationship with God. The hierarchy is when it comes to setting, as we want to call it, legislation, making laws. When it comes to making laws, the way being that most of Judaism its laws are orally transmitted from one generation to the next, and only eventually was it transcribed in the Talmud. It was the people who were busy studying it were the ones that passed it down from one generation to the next. And those are the people that studied in the yeshiva, the laws traditionally, being the ones that had more of an obligation of practicing the laws were men. So therefore men. Do women have an obligation to study laws as well? Of course they do. Laws that are applicable to them. In fact, in my house, the rabbi of my house is my wife, not me. Because she's in charge of everything that happens in the house in all Jewish aspects, the education. In Judaism, what we call a woman of the home is the foundation. Akere Sabai is the foundation of the home. And all the credit goes to the Jewish woman for uh, the foundations, for the education, for everything that's needed. The husband provides the sustenance. He gives the injection. But if you talk about it even from a Kabbalistic perspective, and this goes back, the husband is like the idea. The woman is the one that actually breaks it down and makes it all happen. Mm. So if you want to say, yes, there are man rabbis, and I'm talking about traditional Orthodox Judaism, and in, uh, in pulpit positions, you're going to have only men rabbis because traditionally the ones that were obligated to observe the commandments of the synagogue were the men, while the women were the ones who were uh, making sure the home where most of Judaism is practiced is taken care of. Is that why uh, every Jewish man that comes home, they're told by their wife to take out the garbage? <laughs> That's, I actually tell children who become bar mitzvah at the age 13, I say, you're not a man until you actually take out the garbage. <laughs> you know, Rhea's going to get a kick out of this story, and then Scott brought up the, the garbage. Uh, I've got a, I always tell this story uh, to friends. Uh, you know, I've got... Uh, uh, my father-in-law, may he rest in peace. Uh, I've got a beautiful mother-in-law down in Boynton Beach. Um, uh, my dad, uh, may he rest in peace. But I'll never forget. Uh, I'll never forget the advice he he told me he, uh, when I got engaged. He said, uh, "Just make sure, just make sure you're told never to take. You know that your in-laws never tell you to take out the garbage." <laughs> so that was only, that was the only rule. That was the only rule that was ever set down with uh, my beautiful uh, in-laws. Uh, is uh, never ask me, Scott, never ask me to take out the garbage. <laughs> Rhea, I hope you enjoyed that one, huh? I did, I did. Did I answer your question uh, to satisfaction? So if I just want to summarize your question, is there women rabbis? Rabbis are facilitators of Judaism to help people be inspired. It can be a man or a woman, but in a pulpit position in Orthodox Judaism, there are only men rabbis. So no women rabbis, as it were, within... That sort of high, so I couldn't become a rabbi. You, it, well, you, you can become a facilitator of uh, teaching Judaism to people, and no, I mean, in, in in your position where you have a synagogue and things. If, if I'll tell you what, if you would, uh, do you probably not? I should say you know, and as well, most <laughs> women. I'll tell you even more so. I once asked my wife to put it mildly. I put asked my wife, "Would you like to be the rabbi this week in the shul?" She says, "Not at all. I'm." 
very happy not having to put on the talus, not having to lead the services. I'll sit on my side, read my sitter, and pray to God silently. I'm doing just fine. Right. Once people actually enjoy, and I'm not going to talk for the women because I'm not a woman, but... Um, and I'm sure there are many women that like to have a pulpit position, even within Orthodox Judaism. Um, but most cases, when we learn and appreciate and value the relationship we have with God, that we don't need a hierarchy. And as I said, many rabbis will be upset because I'm taking away a lot of rabbis' job here. Is because the rabbi's job is not to give sermons. The rabbi's job is not to stand up there and be a hierarchy and, and, uh, and scream from the pulpit. The rabbi's job is to inspire the rabbi's job is to facilitate. The rabbi's job is to help the individual have a relationship with God. And it doesn't make a difference if you're a man or a woman, you can do that. I think Scott has something to say. Yeah, also, I, uh, Rabbi Mendy Goldberg is expressing how it works in the uh, more observant Orthodox uh, traditions. Um, in very progressive secular societies, there are different divisions of Judaism. There's conservative and there's reform. Conservative is starting to go in that direction, but I can tell you reform definitely. There are women rabbis um, in the Reform Judaism uh, community. Um, and I think the reason is because if you're Reform, you really don't take the Torah literally. It's more spiritually. Um, and when you when you become more observant, um, you you completely believe that it's the writing of Hashem and and it's not it's not to be taken uh, not literally it's to be taken literally is that correct it's it, yeah I'll, I'll, let me expand on that and as I mentioned before I I don't know if you noticed I said in orthodox synagogues and the reason why I said that is because yes there are other denominations but I started off saying as well that I detest the labels of orthodox reform conservative and whatever else you want to name yourself is because in my humble opinion it's hypocritical Mm. Uh, if we're a Jew, we're a Jew, and Judaism is for every single person the same. Something which is true is consistent and doesn't change. Whether we like it or not, truth doesn't change. Wow. Um, whether I choose to observe all of it, that's my personal decision. Whether I can observe all of it, that's also my personal decision. But the truth doesn't change. So Judaism, the way it is, 2,000 years ago, and that's why going back to our original question that we started today, how is Hanukkah relevant today in 2016, is the same way it was relevant 2,000 years ago. Judaism is relevant every single day, doesn't change regardless who it is. Now, two people can choose to be part of conservative reform or orthodox, that's, the world is free choice. But we have to remember, it's all about the same message. It's all about the truth. And if we look for the truth and we want to do what is true, then we can't be inconsistent because truth is consistent so people who feel more comfortable in a progressive synagogue let's all call it because it's more comfortable to their liking they don't have to feel that they're observant they don't have to feel that it's imposing they whatever it may be that's their choice and i have no problems and objections with it and that's why you will find in some progressive synagogues different uh, observances and adherences and if you would ask even a reform rabbi and a conservative rabbi, they will tell you, yes, this is not the traditional way, the way it was, and so on. And that's why they're called reform by definition, conservative by definition, whatever it may be. But we have to remember, it's not a question of being more spiritual and less religious, because, and this is where I'm going to get a little bit controversial, Judaism is not a religion. Hmm? Feel free to get controversial. Yes. We okay. need some, we need some controversial. My another, another reason I want you to get controversial, and I'm glad that you're here on the show, is that my show yesterday was a, a great show with comedian Eric Heft. It was a great show if you didn't listen to it. But my wife, Sharon, critiques every show that I do. We go into that kitchen that you uh, <laughs> greeted her in, and she sits down with me, and she critiques every show. And she told me I talked too much yesterday <laughs> on the show. So I'm so glad, that, I'm too glad, much? I'm glad that I'm you, not she's not going to tell no, me no. this okay. today. You are so leading the show, right, but, so go but right because, ahead, go because right ahead. what you're saying is so educational, inspiring, but I am blown away when you just said Judaism is not a religion, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, uh, go, ahead, go ahead and Maybe, expand. Maybe, what would you say to that? Yeah. Um, ooh, uh, ooh, uh, I'm all ears. I've got a few questions here, guys. We're getting near the time. So okay, we just... so I'm going to... Go ahead. 
We'll, we'll, we'll conclude with let, this part and then we'll go to the second yeah, part. Yeah, I'll, I'll need to finish this quickly. I'm not worried about that. No, no, we just need to um, get the questions answered. We're just on this topic. It is, we can do another one another day. But let's just, because this is good stuff, isn't it? And everybody's into it. So carry on, Rabbi, carry on. Okay, so let me just finish this point and, and I'll make it quick. What does a religion mean? We would take the word, you do something religiously. That means something religion is a routine. Judaism is something which is absolutely not a routine. Ask anybody when they show up on time, right? It's not a routine. <laughs> Judaism is a faith. Judaism is something I believe in. Judaism is something that's within me. I can't take it out. Religion is something which whether you decide to do it or you don't decide to do it. Judaism is what, as much as you observe or as much as you don't observe, it's there. That's who you are. And because of that... Every Jew, by definition, has a soul. Every Jew, by definition, has an ability to get inspired. Every Jew has a, an ability to observe and has a relationship with God. Whether they're affiliated or unaffiliated, reform, conservative, or orthodox, doesn't make a difference. We are all equally Jewish. We are all equally the same, whether you're a rabbi or you're not a rabbi. That's my point. Wow, wow. Fascinating. Ria, going back over to you, I, I want you to chime in, but I just want to share with you, you keep hearing the word of Judaism, uh, orthodox being said. And back when I was 13 years of age, uh, I was bar mitzvahed. My service was in a, a beautiful orthodox uh, temple on Long Island. And uh, it just so happens that uh, in an orthodox temple, men sit on one side, women on the other. It's called a mechitza. That yep. separates yep. you. But go ahead, Ria. I want you to continue and and stay focused on on the on on our subject here today. No, it's fine, guys. It's all good. I'm I'm picking up on the love. You guys are loving this, this and it's an education for anybody listening as well. So you bet. I've got, I've got another couple of questions. One of them, um, within um, when you're doing a sermon, I think I'm using the right word, Rabbi, and uh, people are coming into the faith and they're embraced into the faith. How are you, how does the religion or yourself look at sexuality? Do you embrace gay people? Is it a problem? Uh, can two gay people just rock in the synagogue and pray with you? Or how does that work? Great questions, Ria. Great, Great question. Go ahead, Rabbi. Great question. Well, in general, in our synagogue, I can talk for my, my synagogue. I can't can talk for any other synagogue around the world. There is no litmus test for somebody to come into the synagogue. Nobody asks you any quiz or question, how much you do observe, what you do believe, whose hand you want to hold, and everything else. And you can walk into synagogue as long as you're not disruptive, as I mean disruptive and disturbing. Uh, you, uh, you can define what disruptive means. But as long as a person's willing to pray and interested in praying, we don't ask a person what they believe in, how they observe, and what they do in their home. However, and this is the big but, we don't condone something which is negated by the Torah. In the book of Leviticus, it clearly states, one man shall not lay with another man. Is that my first question when a person walks and say, are you gay or not? Does it make a difference? Do I embrace a person that's gay and say, yes, every person has challenges, whatever it may be, if that's their choices in life, that's their choice. I don't ask a person if they eat pork before they walk in. I don't ask a person if they stole before they walk in. I don't ask any person whatever it may be. It's not my decision. I'm not here to judge them. That's between them and God. If a person walks into a synagogue and wants to learn about Judaism, it doesn't make a difference to me if they're, they're their sexual, sexual orientation. I am there to teach them. Wow. Rhea, some more questions. So... So in the Orthodox, it's a no-no, but you're okay with it. It's not a question in the Orthodox. Now, if a gay couple comes to me and asks me, can I marry them? Right. Then I will not, because I cannot sanction something which isn't against the Torah. Hmm. So I will accept people, which is I can accept a person for who they are, even though they have differences. That means the same way a person who may not observe any of the other laws in the Torah I cannot, can, for example, if a person doesn't have a kosher home, you know what kosher is, right, Ria? Yeah, yeah. No, I so do, if a yeah. person doesn't have a kosher home, I can't eat in their home. I can't condone that. The same thing is also if a person has a, a sexual orientation that I cannot condone. I can't wed them. I can't officiate at their ceremony. I'll tell you even more so. If a person cremates their loved one, I can't officiate at their funeral. Wow. Because mm -hmm. it's against the Torah. And that's getting more prevalent. And it's it is. Cremation's so getting more prevalent. There are certain things as a standard of a rabbi, I cannot condone certain acts. 
But can I offer my condolences? Can I be there for them? Of course, I have and I will. Wow, that's great. There's also a secondary uh part of this. Um, let's say there's a, an Orthodox Jew who's wearing a yarmulke and he's walking down the street in Queens and he passes a McDonald's um, and he just wants a glass of water from the tap in a paper cup. They really can't do that because there's something called Moritz Zion. And when, they, when that person comes out, um, other observant Jews will look and says, did he just get a Big Mac? Is it, am I right with that? Is that, is that a belief? It's... it's- it's um, not only when it comes to McDonald's, it doesn't have to be in your Queens. It can be even in a place where nobody sees you, even in your own room. For example, you as a caterer can know that if you're a kosher caterer and you're serving a coffee after a meat event, you need to put the bottle of the almond milk or soy milk or whatever you're putting out, even though you have a rabbinic supervision and even though you know you're a kosher caterer and nobody's going to accuse you that you're putting regular milk out. The reason is because any time we do something which may look a little, uh, we don't want to give off a false impression of what we're doing. Right. Judaism is very careful with making sure that even in st- even a little, give you a little example. Um, when I go to the store and I get something, now there's a new ready fad that they don't give you shopping bags. But years ago, everybody got a shopping bag when you left the store, even if you were buying something small. Sure. And I always made sure to take a shopping bag. That nobody should even think that I just shoplifted. Okay, you know, it, it, <laughs> right. it, it okay. doesn't. Maybe because I, I come from Brooklyn, so it's my culture. Or you know, it's all of a sudden I see shoplifters. But the concept is that we don't. We always have to make sure we are giving off the most best positive impression to people around us. Wow. So that's more wow. Italian wow. in a way. Correct. Okay, thank let's you. go back over to Ria. Ria, some more, uh, some more uh, questions, please. Okay, no problem. Thanks for answering that, Rabbi. Um, next one. Big comical, but I've got to ask it, okay? What's with the circumcision thing? Why are you chopping bits? <laughs> I knew that was going to come Rhea, up. I, 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 I went to Vegas and made a bit of that. Just, Rhea's just warming up, by the way. Rhea. Yeah, she's just warming <laughs> <laughs> This is only the start. Rhea's <laughs> ready for her. Rhea, I'm going to tell you a story, but it's not directed at you. Okay? <laughs> a fellow comes to the uh, fellow, the IRS. You know what the IRS, they have that in England, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good with your culture, Rabbi, but just not the Jewish thing. No, the IRS. Well, okay, she, she's, she's she knows what money. the IRS is. Oh, okay. You with, know what the IRS is. Okay, so the IRS right? came to do, yeah. do the Internal Revenue Service, came to do an audit on a synagogue. And he calls in the rabbi and starts questioning the rabbi about everything that's there. So he asks him, let me ask you about those candles that you have lighting. Yeah, where do you get them? What do you do with them? He says, what happens with the candles? They melt, the wax comes all out on the bottom. What do you do with it? He says, well, we melt it back together and we make it a new candle. Then he goes around and he finds something else. The pages that fall out of the prayer books. What do you do with those? Oh, we bind them together and we make new ones. And then every little thing he was going on and on about. Finally, he, the IRS fellow says, let me ask you. By the circumcisions, the foreskin that comes off, what do you do with those? <laughs> the rabbi looks at the IRS agent and says, we send them to Washington and we get back people like you. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> That is great. That is the best joke I've ever heard. That was good, Rabbi. Rhea, you got some great. Rhea, you got some great material to use over there if you want to do stand-up comedy in Europe. So, I wish I had a snare drum and and a cymbal. That was good. That was a good one. So, where does circumcision come from? Abraham, the first Jew, when he was ninety-nine years old. If you're wondering about circumcision, (laughs) he had to circumcise himself at ninety-nine years old. God came to him and told him, "Circumcise yourself." That's what makes you a Jew. God bless him. Abraham did I'm it. Some bad visuals of God as yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. At that point, God said that every Jewish male at age eight years old should circumcise themselves. Now, why is the obligation of circumcision? Why at eight days? So here are a few points. Number one, I'm not going to get into the medical benefits and why at eight days. In fact, they found a study today that at eight days old, and this is... 3,000 years later, they find that eight days old, that's when the um, clotting begins in a child, and that's why eight days old. But the Torah said this over 3,000 years ago. The concept is as follows. The relationship that Jewish people have with God is infinite. The relationship that Jewish people have with God is not something which is comprehensible. How do you define, how do you take a finite person who wants to understand everything and comprehend everything and connect them with something which is infinite. It's impossible. Finite and infinite are two, finite and infinite are two opposites. Mm-hmm. Material and spiritual are two opposites. 
So what does God say here? Do something that doesn't make sense, seemingly. It does make sense. We can explain it. But do it at an age where the child doesn't understand, doesn't have a choice, doesn't realize. And that will be a permanent, and the words in the Bible are, this is a permanent, this is internal covenant between you and God. King David was once bathing himself. And he said, look, I have no relationship with God. I can't pray in the bathhouse. I can't do any mitzvot. I can't do any commandments. But then he remembered he has circumcision. And that's his eternal bond that we have with God. Why do we do it at eight days old? The number seven is a cycle. Eight, if you put it on the side, is infinity. But eight is above and beyond cycle. You will notice that almost everything, how many days are there on Hanukkah is eight. Eight. Miraculous nature, miraculous events are, num- are symbolized by number eight. The Jewish people are a miraculous event. As Mark Twain put it, there's no other nation in the world that was able to stand by and still exists, notwithstanding all the different persecutions that we went through. The number eight is symbolic of what makes us unique as the Jewish people. How are, how are we able to overcome the different persecutions that you spoke about? How are we able to overcome the different challenges that we had throughout our lives and throughout the generations? Was because we have this eternal covenant with God. And that is symbolized through circumcision. Wow, this is a great show. So it had nothing to do with cleanliness? Nothing to do with cleanliness. Wow. Awesome. I don't think wow. people understand that. Was that was unbelievable. As kosher has nothing to do with health. Rhea, I hope uh, the rabbi answered uh, your question on circumcision. Yeah, the number is prevalent, isn't it? But why are guys bits? <laughs> That's why they're the circumcision? Let him pull off a fingernail, you're saying? Yeah, well, I don't know. He's something else. Okay. <laughs> Good question. And I, I don't want to get into the uh, the Kabbalistic. There is a Kabbalistic interpretation as well as to one of the reasons why circumcision, the covenant is there. Uh, first of all, it is to deter the level of promiscuity. According to many, uh, uh, many Kabbalistic interpretations, the concept is that people by nature are promiscuous. People by nature have a libido issue, if you want to call it. And in order to help a person achieve a status of spirituality, they have to diminish their physical pleasure. Even though today there are conflicts if it diminishes the physical pleasure of circumcision or not, but that will lead for a different, uh, it's a family show, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so different people for to decide. But the concept, according to the ballistic interpretation, is number one, there is to be able to diminish that uh, promiscuous pleasure. Number two is, but that's what God said. That's where to do it. Um, and that's probably first and foremost, because that's the place where we have an eternal covenant. Kabbalistically, again, um, it's too, this is, show is too short to be able to go through the nature of the... Uh, our body is symbolic of the way the cosmos and the faculties are above by God. And the um, reproductive organ is symbolic of the foundation, the fundamental part which brings us into the reproductive nature of this world and in order to reproduce we want the covenant and the bond to be in a place where we reproduce wow wow we are sending it back over to you some more uh let's keep uh let's keep raising the bar ria yeah i mean guys we're done on the time so that is kind of the bar to go any more would be challenging i think um maybe too challenging so but i think all in all a good program but we've done our hours so i'll pass it back to you dean okay uh i just want to uh i just one la- do you come want, on do Rhea, you want one to... last question to Rhea, Rhea, i don't the know rabbi, if you want to finish off with the, that the, rab- <laughs> the rabbi doesn't want to finish the show so quickly no You've i want to have... finish with something so gory yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't want to finish Gory, Rhea. You must have something for him. Come on. Okay. Okay. So let's, um, as a, a, an absolute novice onlooker, and I'm listening to Rabbi Mendy, and I'm taking it all on board, and what will I go away with, in all honesty, um, that women know their place within the religion and accept this, but cannot fit within a supposedly non-hierarchical uh, affair that carries a parapet and symbolism, etc. Um, if you're gay, it's kind of a no-no, so you can't go there. And all in all, the positivity is overwhelming. I get the circumcision thing a bit more, so that's quite good. And that is probably what I'll go away from it. And most of all, the positivity that comes with it, I guess. But me, I have, you know, 
Sorry, go one on. At no, a, okay. One at a time. Uh, let uh, let uh, Rabbi uh, Mendy speak, and then Scott, you could speak. So let me finish and and, uh, and actually um, explain two of those things that you mentioned before. In February, there's going to be a conference of over 2,000 women from around the world that are come together, and they are called the shluchos, the rabbis' wives or the rebbitzins. I don't know what you want to call them in English, but the rebbitzins from around the world that come together who run and operate Chabad houses and synagogues around the world. You will ask any person who walks into the synagogue, who's the one, the dominating figure in the synagogue is probably the Rebbitz and not the rabbi. Hmm. So though you may say um, the rabbi is the one that actually gives a sermon and may be doing the fundraising or whatever it may be, the actual, and when you talk about hierarchy, in Judaism, on the contrary, and that's where I just wanted to correct you, just because they don't have a pulpit position, and I think sometimes a pulpit position is demeaning a person to that all he is is he can give a sermon. If somebody were to say that's all my quality, I would find that demeaning, I should say. Um, not that I don't give, that I give bad sermons, but I think there's more to a person than just a public speaker, to a rabbi especially, and you will find that rabbis that are just public speakers, they probably have a very small congregation. Um, the concept is, that there's a there's a an appreciation for women more than they have, and they have a more of an input in Judaism than just a hierarchy than a pulpit, and that's the, the point of that I was trying to get across. As opposed to, and let me just finish off with this as well as as opposed to when it comes to gays, we're all accepting to who individual are, to the individual people, and we appreciate every person for the qualities that they bring to this world and for their qualities that they have in life. Do things that people have. Uh, and observances and challenges or different uh, different ways of life that they choose to uh, accept upon themselves, if they're contrary to Judaism, then yes, then Judaism does not condone it. Let's uh, go over to Scott. He's uh, anxious yeah, I, to I, ask uh, an add to it. I have one uh, really important question for the rabbi. Rabbi, um, I have my own definition how one would describe being a success. And I think... Uh, conventional wisdom, especially in the United States, is more around materialistic. Oh, my son is successful. Um, I don't believe that. I believe su- I, I believe maybe the, the monetary success may be ten or fifteen percent, and it's about your moral character, your compass, your altruistic uh, personality, giving uh, sadaka, um, being empathetic. Um, I'm interested in hearing what your definition of a successful person is. This is a great. Uh, this is a great question and topic that Scott Morell is bringing up because you, I, you and I have had, you and I, Rabbi, have had uh, numerous discussions. It's great that Scott led into that. This is an unbelievable question because it's a great question. Scott. Uh, I'm just now finishing a course, a six week course that we just gave at a Chabad house. How success thinks. And exactly touches upon this question, the Jewish way to thinking of success. And to put it in two paragraphs, success is not defined by how much we earn. And unfortunately, the common way of thinking, the biggest problem is that our educational system defines success as such. So that's what it's not. So then what is success? Success is what you define success. And that's basically what it is. Success is recognizing and realizing, and this is what we started off, and it's interesting, and we made a full circle here. Success is recognizing and realizing that God gave you a signature strength that there's nobody else in the world that has, and you use it to its best. Wow. That is success. But it has to be for good things. You can't be successful for evil things. God didn't give any person a signature strength for evil. Okay. Impossible. There's no such thing. Okay. Even the greatest, the worst of all people. Okay. Rhea, do you, how about, is, was that uh, positive enough uh, to end on Excellent. that? Or you want, uh, great. that Thank was a great you. way, right? Thank you. And I think but I wish I, everybody a happy Hanukkah as well. This is the last Happy holidays yes. and mm-hmm. uh, happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas to everybody out there. And, uh, For our non-Jewish listeners. Yes. And we welcome uh, everyone. happy and healthy new year. You know, on a light note, on a light note, Topic unrelated. I gotta. I always pick on Scott Morell a little bit, and I uh, I heard through the grapevine, Scott, uh, that you uh, that you uh, speak backwards. Backwards. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, Can you I, pray I backwards too? I heard that too? through the grapevine. I'm not going <laughs> to tell you who I heard from, but that's what I heard. 
Well, I like to drive in reverse as well. <laughs> That's why I got that accident a few I do, weeks ago. I do know one thing. I contacted our friend and senior correspondent there in uh, the lovely Rio Bo, and I told her first thing this morning, there's no calls coming in from Scott, no text messages, no catastrophes, no drama. That it came in just in a great way today into the studio, and uh, what a great show we had. I think that's why he was a caterer, because he always wanted to start with the kiddish first. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's very funny. Uh, that's well, funny. Uh, that's great, Rabbi. Does Rhea know what a kiddish is, though? Uh, Rabbi, why don't you tell uh, Rhea what a kiddish is? A kiddish is compared to the wafer and crackers they give it. <laughs> It's a collation after the service. Uh, Jews like to eat after they pray. So, Scott, you speak backwards. Yeah, uh, you know, just give me a word. Uh, Any word. Just uh, simple. Uh, Let's start with Hanukkah. No, 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 no. Love. Eval. Just give me your name. Dean. Dean Blackman. Dean Blackman. Okay, now that sounds like a Jewish name, but I'm going to make it worse. <laughs> I'm going to say it backwards, and it actually becomes more Jewish, so you can't get out of it. So, Dean Blackman is Nem Chelb Naid. Um, now I I could speak full black uh, backwards without looking at at, at anything because I have this photographic memory and it works very uh, well when I'm with two of my friends that also speak backwards. It's not going to define my career. I'm not going to go up the, the the ladder of success with backwards, but it's one of my odd traits. I could say anything backwards in a moment's notice. Wow, wow, yeah. Rabbi, you want to Ria? You want to test Scott? Give me a normal word. Don't Rhea, say give uh, give mining? Scott one or two words. Okay, here's one, Scott Volve. Of love. <laughs> Go ahead again, Rhea. Um, Rhea Bay. Oh, that's easy. Whoa, our ear. <laughs> Rabbi? <laughs> Don't you Jewish. <laughs> because that, that's a tougher one. I want the Kiddush. <laughs> oh, 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 Kiddush is easy. Shadik. <laughs> and, 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 oh, oh, it's a lot of fun. Chalant. Oh, God. Uh, Tanoloch. Um, and uh, Chalant is wonderful. And Kishka? Wow. <laughs> now, that is the most Jewish word you could possibly get forwards. Uh, kishka is Akshik. So it's just it's just a strange uh, trait I have. I thought the audience would like to know that I'm not completely normal. I'll tell you what. It's not necessarily not complete normal. I'll, I'll just finish off with this. I mean, and very interesting because Scott said success is how you are generous and tzedakah and so on. There's one word in Hebrew. You know, there's some words in English you have like mom, dad. That can be, I forgot both the word. Ways. That can be read both ways. In Hebrew, one of the words that can be read both ways is vinatnu, and you will give. Wow. wow. What God says is when one gives, they automatically get back. Wow. wow. So one for a recipe for success that Scott mentioned before is being generous. Any person that's generous, God's generous with them. And especially as we're now by the holiday season and Hanukkah is coming up, remember that when we help a person that's less fortunate or helping people celebrate the holidays, it goes both ways. But we don't, but we give not to get back. We don't give to get back. But we can get back, but it's not, that's not the primary motive. It's not the primary motive, but it's an automatic reciprocation. Oh, that's in nice fact, to know. Not, in fact, you will find yourselves, and I tell this to people who are feeling down and depressed, if you're ever feeling down, go out and help somebody. That's a great thing. Wow. And you'll always feel good about and it. I know, and I know uh, uh, in, in Jewish uh, culture, you're supposed to give back 10% of your income. Am I correct about yes. that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We'll have another one for that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Rhea, right, before, this was great. before I close uh, the show, anything else that you want to uh, say, Rhea? No, we're good to go. It's been a lovely show, an education. Lovely to have you on, Rabbi. Thank you so much for coming in. And the lovely listeners, I hope you enjoy it and enjoy your holidays. Back to you, Dean. Thank you, Ria. Same here, and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person one day. Yeah, well, Ria, I, as always, I want to thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, being on the show and everything that you do. So uh, thank you again. Uh, Scott, uh, Scott, as always, uh, thank you uh, for your participation and, and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for my dear friend and my, and my rabbi, Rabbi Mindy Goldberg, uh, uh, I can't thank you enough. I mean, my energy, I'm ready to do a few more shows right now. I mean, with you, uh, just go on the rest of the day. You are, uh, you are a saint. You are a very, very special friend to my family and I. And if anyone, if anyone wants to meet this great person, uh, Rabbi Mendy Goldberg, uh, the Lubavitch Chabad, 
uh, the East End. It's in Quorum. If people do want to reach you, uh, why don't you share with the audience, uh, Rabbi, how they could get in touch with you? They can go to our website. It's probably the easiest way, jewishli.com, or contact me, Rabbi G, at jewishli.com. Personal email, always available 24 6 over the phone, email, and one day a week in person. <laughs> we should, I like the 24 We six. should also close, and this will be a new word that Rhea hears that uh, to our my listening audience and to everybody, L'chaim, right? Oh. L'chaim, I right? said in honor of Hanukkah, we should have some L'chaim. Right? Right? Exactly. <laughs> Why do you tell Rhea before I close L'chaim. what L'chaim is, and, and obviously anyone else in the audience that doesn't know what L'chaim, first spell it. L'chaim is L-C-H-A-I-M. You gotta have that in you. So you, oh, you always, <laughs> and I, I'm surprised we don't have the bottle of Manischewitz on the oh, table. Oh, Manischewitz. I was hoping for something older. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, L'chaim means, uh, as you would say, cheers in your language. And uh, But L'chaim means to life. Because whenever Jewish people get together, we always want to make sure to bring life into the world. There's actually a song uh, during the Hora, to life, to life, L'chaim. And so it, it definitely is pertinent. So on that note, L'chaim to everybody in my audience. Uh, I'd like everybody to go to the show's Facebook page. Please like us. Uh, go to the YouTube channel, the show's YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button. If you'd like to leave a comment, please, on the box below. We'd love to hear comments. The last couple of months... All our shows are archived right now on the iTunes platform. You could find them. Uh, if you'd like to share your story, ideas, be a guest on the show, please go to deanbleckman.com and email me directly. I would like to thank all my listeners for being with us today. From all of us at the Dean Blackman Show, have a great day. You've been listening to the Dean Blackman Show live from Long Island, New York. From all of us here, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing your comments via Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and email. And don't forget, you can visit the webpage anytime for the up-and-coming guest list. From all of us here, have a good evening.